Good morning. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. Ready to go, people? Ready, ready? Okay, here we go. All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Tuesday. Welcome to History 12 again, the class where we learn about history. I don't know. <laughs> you know, sometimes when you say something and you, you, you think that, like, if you just start talking, something funny will come out, and then nothing funny comes out? That's, that's what happened. Um, so uh, yesterday we were talking about the syllabus for this class and as I mentioned you can find it on um, uh, you can find it on student portal under course documents and that's where um, that's where I'll post all of the lecture slides for the course so that you can see them again if you if you need to and so this is what the syllabus looks like it's got kind of all of the important information for the course little description here the book which I'm going to get for you but I haven't quite yet um, some of the skills that we'll be working on, and I talked about those yesterday in, the, um, uh, in my little slideshow. There's a brief kind of schedule of what we'll be talking about in this course, but it's, um, it, again, it's, it's subject to change. I kind of go as fast or slow as I feel we need to go. Uh, I may try and add some extra things into um, into the, the course as we go this time, just to keep it interesting. Spoiler alert, I almost never get to the Middle East. Um, I've, got, I've got a number of, uh, I've got a little kind of section built for it, but I, we never seem to, we never seem to get to it, but I'm gonna try to get to it this time because it's an important and interesting part of the world. Um, again, that will change. And then I had um, the evaluation methods here, so your, attendance and participation was 10%, so that was showing up in terms of actually being here, but also showing up in terms of, you know, paying attention and answering questions and asking them. That's all part of showing up, right? Um, I'll have some assignments for you, which I'm still working on, uh, so you'll see those when, when it's time. We'll have some quizzes. We'll have a final assignment, which I have an idea of what I want to do, but I haven't quite fleshed it all out yet. Um, yeah, and then there's some other information here that you can look at as well, but that's that's posted for you. So, before we 
Before we continue, does anyone have any burning questions they want to ask that I can answer, or should we just jump right in? Jump right in? Okay, here we go. So, let's do, oops, here we are. Right, so, <clears throat> this course has kind of three kind of larger themes or big ideas, and they're quite big and they're quite general. There's lots of things that we can kind of talk about within them, but they, they kind of help to tell the story of the 20th century, so the time between roughly 1900 and roughly 1999. Right? Um, and the three big ideas, as you can see, are this. Um, one is that nationalist movements can unite people in common causes or lead to conflict between different groups. Um, does anyone know what nationalism is? Yeah, very true, right, yeah. So, so people within a certain country, they have a strong kind of identity of themselves as a group, right? And they're, you know, they, they feel that they should be in charge of their own destiny, right? So nations, nations feel that they should have their own state, right? That they should be able to rule themselves. They don't, they don't want to be ruled by someone else, right? By another nation. So yeah, we'll talk about how that idea of nationalism can be useful, right? It can be, um, it can bond people together, but it can also create some pretty significant conflict as well. And so we'll try to talk about that in the context of the 20th century, but also in the context of the modern world, because it's still, it's still an important force. Number two, we'll talk about the rapid development and proliferation. What does proliferation mean? <laughs> proliferation. Sophie knows. Sophie doesn't know? No? Proliferation is like with spreading around, right? So you get a technology, you get a technology, everybody gets a technology. Proliferation. So that, that technology led to profound social, economic, and political changes. I don't know that there has been a century that had more technological development than the 20th. I would imagine the one we're in will ultimately be have more technological development, but the 20th century, like, can you name some things that were invented in the last century? Computers. Yep, computers. What's that? Yep, what else? Atomic bombs, Atomic bombs yeah. Nuclear weapons, what else? Cell phones. Internet. Fax machines. Airplanes. Automobiles. The radio. I know nobody listens to it anymore, but, you know, it, at the turn of the century, it was super important. Uh, what else has been invented? We've gone to space, right? Space shuttles, gosh, what else? Telecommunications, genetic technology, all kinds of, um, all kinds of medical developments, vaccines, right? Huge. So there, there was an interesting, there was an Instagram post I saw last week or the week before and it said that the oldest person in the world right now, although they're probably dead and it's somebody else because they <laughs> tend to die quickly, but the oldest person in the world right now has, was alive when the first airplane took off, right? So the, the two Wright brothers, Wilbur and Orville Wright, they sort of perfected a plane that could fly in I think 1911, I think is when it was, when they got their prototype plane to first fly. So that the world's oldest person was alive when that happened, and they were alive for the first helicopter flight on Mars. 
Is that not insane? Like the amount of technological development that we've gone through, you know, just getting a plane, like just getting something to fly, and now we're flying things on Mars? Ridiculous, right? That's a, no other century has seen such a huge development in technology. So we'll try to talk a little bit about that. Um, and finally, the breakdown of long-standing empires created new economic and political systems. So yeah, the 20th century is a kind of major reorganization of former colonial empires into a lot of nation states and a lot of um, confusion and um, you know conflict and opportunity goes goes with that and we'll try to see it so those are kind of the three bigger ideas of this course and we'll try to work inside those I think I talked about this idea yesterday about what history was and you know again so often we start talking about history in terms of names and dates right the battle of this happened on November 15th, 1902, and blah, 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 right. And it's just a bunch of, it's just a bunch of facts, right? And, and the facts are important, right? They, they give us the kind of structure. But again, history is really more of a story, right? It's a story that we build and we tell ourselves about who we are and how we've come to be in this place, right? Um, And it's important, I think, for a number of reasons, because this morning in social justice, it, I asked the question in a, in a different context. But I asked the question of, who are you, right? What's your, what's your identity? What words describe who you are? And so people came up with a bunch of words, and some people said they were creative. Some people said that they were friendly or outgoing or... Um, compassionate or introverted or whatever. They came up with lots and lots of different adjectives. But how do you know that those words describe you? How do you know that you are funny or compassionate? Let's say funny. How do you know that you're funny? You just know? Yeah because you have made people laugh in the past, right? In your past, there have been historical events where you have said something and people have gone, ah, it's hilarious, right? People have told you that you are, that you're funny. So people this morning were talking about their identity and they were basing it on their own history, right? What their history was helped to tell them who they were. It helped them to understand what kind of person they were because things had happened to them in the past, right? And that had informed their perception of who they were. And not only do we do this all the time, right? Because the only way I know who I am right now is to look at my history behind me, right? But countries and the world do the same thing. And humanity as a whole does the same thing. How do we know what Canada is? Well, we look back, right? Where does Canada come from? How was it formed? Why was it formed? Who was here when it was formed? What has happened to us over the past 154 years since we started being Canada, right? And if we understand those events, then we kind of understand what Canada is at the moment. Just like you, if you understand your past, if you understand what happened to you, then you'll have a much better idea of who you are right now, right? And so, again, the past is important to understand because it, it, it tells you what something is, right? Whether it's you or your family or your country or the planet or humanity as a whole, the story is important. You can't understand where you are unless you know what the story is before, right? And I think that applies to, to all of us. Right? Um, 
Yeah, so historians, when they're writing, they'll use narrative. They're trying to tell you a story about what happened. And for most historians, they're trying to not only to tell you what happened, but they're trying to prove a point to you. They're trying to convince you that, yes, these things happened, right? But more than that, they're trying to say that this is what it means, right? This is, this is why these things have occurred. This is what the effect of these events is. This is why Canada is what it is, because of these events, right? So historians will be trying to tell you a story, but they're also trying to convince you of something in the process. They're trying to tell you that the history means a certain thing, or something that you know exists in the modern world is that way for a reason, okay? So, even though we might assume that historians are writing objectively, again, they are not. Okay? What does it mean to be objective? What does it mean to be objective? Or subjective? What does it mean to be either of those things? Yeah, so someone who's being objective, they're not putting their emotion into it, right? They're not, um, they're not letting their personal feelings kind of influence what they're doing or what they're saying, maybe. Yeah, if you're being objective, you're doing that. If you're being subjective, then you are letting those things influence it, right? So again, history is not objective, right? Historians are certain people. They're coming from a certain place and they're trying to convince you of a certain thing. So they're not just a bunch of facts. History is a story that people tell other people, and they tell them, those, they tell them that story for a reason, okay? So what happens, good morning, let's go, let's go, let's go. So historians tell us a story and they tell us that story, they tell us that story because they're trying to prove a point. And so in doing so, in trying to prove that point, they choose certain events to tell us about, right? Some events are significant, some are not, right? So again, if I want to tell you the story of Canada, my birth is not a significant event in that story, right? I have nothing to do, I have nothing to do with the story of Canada whatsoever. I am a nobody. I'm a Canadian, but nobody's ever heard of me. I never did anything great. I'm just a regular person, right? But John A. Macdonald, our first prime minister, yeah, he's significant, right? He's an important part of our history for good or for evil. So again, historians will try to convince you of something and they'll pull certain people and certain events out of the history and they'll make their story from it. And they'll omit others, right? They'll omit other things because they believe they are not significant. So again, my, my birth will not show up in any story of Canada, but John A. Macdonald will show up in every one, right? Because there's the difference of significance there. Um, again, you'll, history is not only about significance and story and objectivity or, I guess, subjectivity. Um, this is kind of, you hear this in, in quotes like this. Have, has anyone heard this quote before? History is written by the winners or the victors. No? It's reasonably popular, but again, it, it says that very thing, right? Is that the people who, the people who have power, the people who are in charge, they're the ones who get to create the official story, right? And so the story of Canada is, for the most part, create, created by the Canadian government, right? And for the most part, it's created for the purpose of um, 
inspiring Canadians, right? And, and probably all of us have this, right? Um, have you all been taught the story of your country? What your country is, what happened to it in the past, what it is now, why you should be proud of it, right? That's very common, right? All states kind of have to do that. They have to create their origin story and tell the people of the country so that they can cooperate and unite and feel proud and feel like they're part of something good. All countries do this, right? And Canada is no exception. Canada has done that as well. Um, but again, the question is, who gets to decide what the story is, right? Who does history belong to? Right? Who gets to decide what the story of Canada is, or what the story of China is, or what the story of Vietnam is, or Japan, or Nigeria? Who gets to choose what the official story is? Because the story can be different depending on which events you choose to tell and which events you choose to you know, leave on the shelf. Right? History is subjective. When historians create history, they create it based on two types of sources, primary and secondary sources. Anyone know what a primary source is? What is it? Okay, so the handwriting of someone who's telling the story. Yeah? What else might be a primary source? A piece of evidence from from the event, yeah. So some something that was kind of produced at the time, right? At the place. So exactly. Um, that's my next slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So primary sources are yeah original things from the time period that we're studying, right? So it could be something that someone wrote down at the time, right? Maybe they wrote a speech or maybe they wrote in their diary. Dear diary, this happened, right? Um, it could be photographs, right? Photographs are good primary sources from the time. Could be documents, right? Official government records, very boring to read, but sometimes you can discover things from them. Newspaper articles from the time, all of those are good primary sources, okay? Now, it's very tempting for us to think that primary sources are unbiased, that they are objective, right? Because the person was, was there, were they not? Yeah, right? But imagine this. I'm going to create a primary source, okay? I'm going to write a biography, a book on Justin Trudeau, the story of Justin Trudeau, the man with the fancy hair or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Whatever you want to say about him. I'm going to write this book about Justin Trudeau. And in 300 years, so in the year 2321, when you know everyone's flying around in spaceships or whatever they're doing, somebody's going to pick up my book, The Life and Times of Justin Trudeau by Mike Metcalf. And they're going to read it. And they're going to go, wow, primary source. This guy was here. Right? I was here at the time. I must know. But do I? Do I know Justin Trudeau? In fact, I do not. <laughs> I do not know him. I've never met him. I've never been in the same room as him. I've probably been in the same city as him at the same time, but that's as close as I've ever been to Justin Trudeau. Do I know anything about him personally? No. I read the newspapers. I read what they say about him. I have my own opinions of him. But do I know him? No. So people may be tempted in 300 years to read my book and say, oh, this is a primary source from the same period, right? This guy, Mike Metcalf, whoever he was, he was alive when Justin Trudeau was Prime Minister of Canada. 
he must know. But does he know? He does not, right? He doesn't know. <laughs> he doesn't know anything about Justin Trudeau beyond what you read in the papers. So, am I a good primary source? Maybe it depends what I say, and it depends what you're trying to get from me, right? If you think that I know everything, every intimate detail of Justin Trudeau, you're going to be wrong. I don't know that. If you think that, well, you know, I'm a person who was living at the time, and I might know how people kind of thought about Justin Trudeau, that's possible, right? I talk to people, I hear what people say, I, I think I kind of know what people feel about Justin Trudeau, maybe, right? So. Primary sources are not necessarily objective, right? In that just because you were there doesn't mean you know everything, right? So just because somebody lived during, you know, just because somebody lived in Germany during World War II doesn't mean they know anything about Adolf Hitler, right? They might, but they also might not. But the other thing is that primary sources are not necessarily objective because they can have bias as well, right? So let's say I wrote that book on Justin Trudeau. Why might I write such a book, do you think? Why, why would I write a book about Justin Trudeau, maybe? What would be my motivation for that? To, to what? To record like as, as some sort of historical recording of what happened? Sure, I might be interested in recording history. Why else might I write a book like that? What might be a motivation for me to write a book based about somebody's life? <laughs> it could be. Maybe I really dislike him, right? And so how's my book gonna read? Mm -hmm. My book could be all, all about how Justin Trudeau is an incompetent moron, right? How did this guy ever become prime minister? I don't know. I wouldn't trust him to run a lemonade stand, right? I could, I, it could be a really harsh book. To what? All right. So maybe I might try to... Yeah, maybe I think that people have the wrong idea about Justin Trudeau. People think something, but maybe I feel that I know something different. So I, the real truth, right? I'm going to expose the truth to people, right? Uh, what's another reason I could write that book? I could hate him. On the opposite side, I could, I could, yeah, I could think he's really great. Right, so I might write a, you know, a nice soft, puffy novel that not novel, but biography that makes Justin Trudeau seem like he's the greatest human being ever, with cool hair to boot. Right, I could write that one. Um, what other reason could I write that book? <laughs> I might just want the money. Right, maybe I think that there is. You know, maybe there's money in writing this book, right? And so maybe, how would that change what I write? Yeah, maybe I'll make it interesting. Maybe I'll make it really interesting. Maybe I'll make it so interesting that it's not entirely factual anymore, right? Maybe I'll kind of make it a little sexier than Justin Trudeau's actual life is, right? And so, Whatever, whatever reason, whatever book I wind up writing, sure, it's a primary source. I was here, but is it unbiased? No, right? Because it depends why I'm writing the book in the first place. Do I love him? Do I hate him? Do I want to just record history as it happened? Do I want to, you know, tell people the real truth, whatever that is? Do I even know what the real truth is? 
am I just trying to make money off this thing? And so I'll just tell people whatever is, you know, sexiest so that they pick up the book and read it? Who knows, right? So my primary source might be very informative and very accurate, or it might be a big a trash, <laughs> trash reading, right? It could be any of those things. So primary sources are great as long as you know the limits of them, right? As long as you know what you can believe and what you can kind of discover from the primary source and what you can't, right? They're not all, they're not all gospel truth, right? Some of them are, you know, some of them are very helpful, some of them not really. Do I have a, oh yeah. So here, some primary sources. Here's one, right? Here's a little marriage certificate from, uh, from 1917. Eleanor Anderson, no, not Eleanor, Elmer, sorry, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a lesbian marriage in 1917. Uh, it's Elmer Anderson and Laura Mae Wilson, right? Married on March, the 14th of March, 1917, right? So again, we can't really gain too much information from this primary source. It depends on what story we're trying to tell. I'm not sure that these people are of note. I, I think they're nobodies, <laughs> but, but again, it's a, it's a primary source. Right. Here's another primary source. Does anyone know what this is? Yeah, do you know what it's a map of? It's kind of hard to tell. Any idea? It is, in fact, it is, in fact, one of the first maps of the United States. And so two explorers, um, Lewis and Clark, who you may have heard of, Meriwether Lewis and James Clark, I forget his name. Uh, these two guys made their way across, um, made their way across what's now the United States hundreds of years ago, trying to map out what the land was like. And this is what they came up with. This is their map that took them years to piece together. Again, it doesn't look exactly like the United States as we know it today, but you know, for hundreds of years ago, a pretty good map. Right? Again, a primary source. Here's a primary source. Let me tell you, my fellow countrymen, that all signs point this way, that the 20th century shall be the century of Canada and Canadian development. For the next hundred years, Canada shall be the star toward which all men who love progress and freedom shall come. That's very inspiring, is it not? Um, and that's our Prime Minister, Sir Wilfrid Laurier, speaking at Toronto's Massey Hall, 14th of October, 1904. So this is a primary source. This is a speech that he gave right at Massey Hall in Toronto. And what's he, what's he saying in your own words? What's the point here? Yeah, that Canada's gonna be a better place. Everything's everything's going up and up, right? Progress, everything's getting better. Mm -hmm. This next hundred years is gonna be phenomenal, right? Smooth sailing, Canada's star is going to rise, whatever, however you want to say it. Everything's gonna be great. Right? Now Let me ask you this. So we know who the speaker is, right? The speaker is Wilfrid Laurier, one of, our, one of our prime ministers. He's the guy on the $5 bill, by the way, uh, Wilfrid Laurier is. Who do you think he's speaking to? Yeah, Canadians, right? So he's, he's at Massey Hall, which is kind of a, a hall, kind of a theater. It's very old in Toronto. It's very prestigious. So there's probably lots of government people there and sort of, you know, society people there and maybe the media is there as well. But I bet that he was also being recorded and they were, uh, was that too early? No, it's probably too early for radio. Um, too early for radio, but the press was probably writing down 
what he said, and they were going to publish it in the newspaper the next day. So yeah, he's speaking to all of Canada, right? Hey, Canadians, the next hundred years is going to be amazing, right? Look out, Canada, Canada's star is rising. Now, do you think that's the way he really felt? Does this, does this short quote here, does it tell us how he actually felt? It's a primary source. We know he said it. We know who he is. Sophie's kind of like, hmm. What are you thinking? Do you, do you, do you think we can take him, take him at his word that this is what he believes? Not really. Why not? Why would he? Why would he just be saying that? Yeah, yeah. So, what do we know about Wilfrid Laurier? Well, we know he's a politician, right? We know how they are. And who's his audience? Canada, right? And so, what do the people want to hear? And sometimes, what do the people need to hear? They need to hear reassurance, right? Hey guys, don't worry, everything's gonna be great, everything's headed upwards, you know, the next hundred years are gonna be prosperity and growth and it's gonna be it's gonna be amazing, right? That's what people really wanna hear. Does it reflect how Wilfrid Laurier feels? Well, it's hard to say, right? Because his audience is all of Canada. Now, if this was not a speech, let's say this was written in his diary, okay? So the little diary that he keeps under his pillow and he writes in every night, like a, you know, like a 12-year-old girl, I'm just teasing. Um, he writes his little diary and he says, dear diary, let me tell you, diary, that I think all signs point to the fact that Canada, the next 100 years are gonna be so awesome for Canada, right? Canada's just going to go up and up and up. Do you think that reflects how he really feels? Probably, right? Because who's his audience for the diary? Yeah, no one, just himself, right? And so, again, both are primary sources, but both have different audiences, right? So what Wilfrid Laurier says when he's in front of the microphone in Massey Hall with all of Canada listening is very different from what he might say to his diary or to his wife, right? When they're, you know, sitting there eating their, you know, their roast beef in the evening, you know, he might say that to her, right? He might say, yeah, you know what, Mildred? I don't know what her name was. <laughs> you know what, Mildred? The next hundred years are gonna be fantastic. Or he might say, you know what, I think we're screwed, or something in between. But again, the audience makes a difference, right? Just because someone says it doesn't mean that they mean it, right, in a primary source. He might mean it. I think he probably did mean it, to be honest. But just because somebody says it or writes it doesn't mean it's true, and what they say <coughs> is influenced by the audience that they're speaking to, right? And so when the audience is all of Canada, Wilfrid Laurier is going to say one thing. When he's just talking to his wife over dinner, he may say the exact same thing, or he may say something different, right? So again, there are limits to what we can take from a primary source, right? Primary source like this, I'm not sure if he believes that or not. That sounds like something a politician would say. He might believe it, he might not. But again, if it was his diary, that might be different, right? That's a different source. Yeah, so the point I'm trying to make here is that primary sources are always biased. They're always subjective, okay? Because again, primary sources write from their own perspective. Right? And so they know some things and they don't know others. Do I know what Justin Trudeau's private life is like when he goes home and has dinner with his wife and kids? 
I have no idea, right? I have no idea what goes on there. Is he a great father and a great husband? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. I don't know, right? So there are real limits to what I can know about Justin Trudeau, right? The other thing is that I have my own, I might have my own motivations, right? So I might be motivated to portray Justin Trudeau as a great person and a great leader. I might be motivated to tear him down and make him seem like he's evil. I might just be motivated to make money and, you know, say whatever I want. It's hard to know. Primary sources are also written for a certain audience, right? Sometimes it's the nation, sometimes it's government officials, sometimes it's just, you know, the person themselves, if they're writing their diary or something like that. And so, depending on who the audience is, we will be able to kind of discover or believe different things, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so if that's, a, if that's a primary source, what's a secondary source? Sorry, say that one more time. Right. Yeah, exactly. So a secondary source will take a primary source or a bunch of primary sources and tell the story based on them, right? And so has anyone ever read a history textbook before? That's a secondary source, right? They're based on other things. The writer of the textbook was not there for all of these events, right? But they borrowed from other places. Historians do this. Has anyone ever seen a historical documentary on anything? Secondary source, right? The documentary has, they've done their research. Sometimes they interview people who were there. Sometimes they read quotes, right? They read letters or speeches. They show you footage from the time, right? Either photographs or video from that time. And they put all those things together into a secondary source, right? So a lot of what we read in terms of history is this. It is a secondary source, okay? And so people will look at primary sources, they'll put them together in such a way that they tell a particular story, right? So this is a perfect example here since we're talking about Canadian prime ministers. This is a book that came out a number of years ago called Unbuttoned. A History of Mackenzie King's Secret Life. So William Lyon Mackenzie King was Prime Minister of Canada for um, a couple of, t two or three times, I think. And he's actually our longest serving Prime Minister ever. So he was in power for, I think, six or eight years, and then he had a little break, and then he came back again. And so he was Prime Minister the most in, in Canada, in, in the 1950s, I think, if I remember. And this is a secondary source because it's based on William Lyon Mackenzie King's diary. And so Mackenzie King kept a lot of diaries. He wrote you know, what happened to him and how he felt and what he thought. And in his will, when he died, he asked that those diaries be destroyed because he didn't want anyone reading his diary, right? Which is fair, right? It's like you're... It's like your browser history, right? Nobody. Have you guys seen the cartoon where it's like in a courtroom, and uh, the, the, there's a guy on the the stand. He's testifying, and the lawyer's like, uh, "Your Honor, I'd like to submit my client's browser history." And the guy in the stand is like, uh, "That's okay. I just rather confess to the murder." <laughs> anyway, so Mackenzie King didn't want his diary published. Uh, he wanted it destroyed. But for some reason, it was not destroyed. And so historian here, Christopher Dummett, I think his name is. That's unfortunate. Christopher read the diaries and then wrote a biography of Mackenzie King's life based on other sources, right, that talked about him, but also based on these primary sources, these diaries that really no one else had read. 
And what he discovered, I know there's a lot of text here, but what he discovered was that our Prime Minister, William Lyon Mackenzie King, was kind of an odd character. And he didn't seem so odd in the news. He seemed like a regular old Prime Minister. But uh, in his diary, he talked about you know, his um, meetings with prostitutes. He talked about um, the fact that he was very spiritual and he had seances and thought he could talk to spirits. He had a very close relationship with his mother, maybe a little too close, who knows. Uh, yeah, so he was, you know, he, he thought he could talk to ghosts and things like that. So there were all these things that people never really knew about Mackenzie King that came out in the process of um, reading this or writing this book. So again, the, the book itself is a secondary source but part of it's based on this primary source, his extensive diaries in which he talked about things that he did and what he thought and what he felt. And again, because he assumed that no one else would ever read them, we can probably assume that they're reasonably honest. Right? And so we've actually learned quite a bit about, um, about Mackenzie King from his kind of browser history, unfortunately for him. Um, Okay, does that make sense so far? Primary sources, secondary. The, maybe the last thing we should say about secondary sources is that they too have a bias, right? Because they are also created by people who are trying to tell a story, but they're also trying to convince you of something, right? And so documentaries usually have this kind of idea as well. There's a main point that they're trying to convince you of. And so we'll talk about that a little bit later. But again, bias is not a bad thing. Almost everything is, has a bias to it. The important thing is that we understand what it is, right? So my book on Justin Trudeau will be biased. The question is, is what my bias is, right? Do I want to make him seem great or awful? Do I just want the money? Am I trying to create a you know actual historical document that is accurate one way or the other i'm going to bias it the question is how right and again once you know what the bias is then you can understand you know what you can believe and what you cannot right okay questions at the moment okay Let's take a quick break, we'll come back in 10 minutes, and we'll, I think we'll talk a little bit about World of War A1, okay?
Here we go. All right, and we're back. So the point I'm trying to make here is that you know we should be somewhat critical when we read historical sources, right? Whether they be primary or secondary, because in either case, primary sources are, you know, they don't know everything, even if they were there at the time. They have different motivations for writing or saying the things that they write or say. Um, and so, you know, there's some things we can learn from those primary sources and some things we can't. And again, that's okay as long as we recognize kind of the limits of what we can d determine, right? And so a perfect example of that was the Wilfrid Laurier speech. He says that, you know, the next hundred years, Canada is going to be going up and up and progress and riches and all kinds of things, right? But is that how he really feels? It's hard to say, right? It's what, it's what he said. It's what he should have said as a prime minister. Did he feel it? Probably, but we don't know for sure, right? And so primary sources are great, but they do have limits, right? And again, secondary sources are great as well, right? Often they have a more clear picture because they've looked at a bunch of different primary sources and sort of tried to put the story together from those, but they're telling us a story as well based on what they want us to believe right? and so they're going to choose certain sources they're going to choose certain events and they're going to leave out some others and that's going to present the story a certain way and so again there's nothing necessarily wrong with that we just have to know what they're trying to convince us of right what is the point of the story and we'll try to talk about that a little more as we go forward okay Good so far? Good, good, good? Okay. So, I don't know if you guys have a sense of, of what this would have been like, but what do you think it would have been like to live in, let's say, the year 1900? So, 120 years ago, none of the technology that you are familiar with exists. Uh, what do you think living in that world would be like? Boring. <laughs> Boring. I know, like, what did people do? If they couldn't, like, scroll through their Instagram whenever they were bored? What did they, what did they do? Go fishing? Yeah, they probably did, actually. Fishing's boring, too, sometimes. <laughs> Uh, that's interesting. Do you, do you think people had, do you think people were like more easily entertained or they had different ideas about what was exciting and what wasn't? Right. So, it, yeah, it's, it's, sometimes it's difficult to imagine what life would have been like in a different time, right? And again, because we're, because we're such a technological society, like it's really difficult to imagine, you know, what life would have been like without basically all of those, all of those things that we've come to expect, right? No computers, no internet, no cell phones. Um, even regular telephones probably wouldn't have been that common in 1900. Nobody would have had a radio. If you wanted to know something, you would have had to read the newspaper. Um, what else? There were really no, no cars to speak of. Cars were kind of just being invented, and there was a few of them around, but almost nobody really had one. If you wanted to go somewhere, you went in a horse carriage. Planes didn't exist. Like, that's a totally different world, is it not? I mean, even I, this will probably shock you, and I hate to admit it, but yeah, like, I grew up in a world with no, 
with no internet, with no cell phones, with no Google. And it, it, what's really interesting is that I can barely remember what that was like. Like I do not know, I don't know how we lived our lives before we had, before we had these things, right? Has anyone had a, an, something happen to them where like they didn't have a piece of technology and they were like, almost like they were thrust into the past? Like where you had like no access to a piece of technology you needed? Yeah? What, what happened? Right. <laughs> I know, right? What What do you do? Right. You walk until you see Yeah. Yeah. It, it's strange, eh? Hey? I um I used to work in in Russia during the summer. That was my when I was a graduate student. I worked in Russia, and. The first couple of years I was there, I didn't have I didn't have a mobile phone with me, and so um, la later on later on when I started going there, I brought I brought my mobile phone and I got a Russian SIM card and it was fine. First couple of years I didn't have it, and so like when when you went out into the city, like if you left your apartment and you split up from your the friends, the people I was working with, I had no way to contact them. Right? I couldn't say, oh, I'll be here later, or where are you, or do you want to meet? Like, if you didn't arrange it at the time, once you split up, there was like no way to contact them. You had to like go back to you know, the apartment you were renting and I guess you know, try and call them on the phone and see if they were home. And if they weren't home, you didn't know anything. You didn't know where they were, you couldn't contact them, and it was really weird. Um, it was a really weird thing to be without it. Um, Benedict here, oh yeah, Benedict said, yeah, my phone died in the middle of the night and I couldn't get an Uber, so I had to walk out onto the main road and try to flag a taxi. Yeah, so the, we're very used to be, being able to communicate with people instantly all the time, right? And then all of a sudden when we lose that capability, it's very, it's very strange, right? Very strange. Um, yeah, I think it would have been a totally different world in 1900, so prior to World War I. People were living in, yeah, a, a different technological state, certainly in North America, I, I will, you know, in the rest of the world, for sure. Um, but it was also kind of globally speaking, it was a different world too. And so, you know, the world, well, the world still does look like this, but, <laughs> um, this was kind of a, an end of an age of colonialism. Um, if I asked you what colonialism was, what would you tell me? Is what? Before independence, right? And so, what 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 is it to be? What what does it mean? Like, what was happening during this colonial period? What's that? Yeah. So other so other countries, particularly like Britain and France and yeah, Netherlands, they were running around the world taking control of other places, right? Enslaving populations, in some cases sending people to be slaves in other part of the world. What else is happening? Yeah, that, that colonial period was heavily um, heavily kind of motivated by trying to get resources, right? Wood, oil, minerals, rubber, things like that, spices, all of those things were kind of being taken from um, countries in Africa, in Southeast Asia, in India, uh, and being sort of sent back to Britain and France and so on, right? Andre and, and Sophie, what were you saying? Did you see something? Oh, what, what, what were you going to say? Yeah. 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 
more common than take the and form the profile of all. Then you just take it to the out, take it to the from that. But they also give them this. But it doesn't have to be that five yeah, I guess depending on depending on your individual colonial history, some things you know you gain things, but you also lose lose other things, right? Um, would you do you think it's fair to say that how how important do you think colonialism and and the sort of the the, the whole colonial period? How important do you think that is in terms of how the modern world looks today? I think it's like a strong, like a, like a important sign of like a country to be more um, independent of what's going on. It's like a country uh, over it, taking control by other, like Britain or France, and then they were like, increase their nationality to the people in the country and then maybe someday they want to get independent of themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So there's there was you know the, yeah, there was a time when most of these areas were reasonably independent from each other, right? And then we had this period where um, a lot of countries fell under the control of just a few and then there was this process of becoming independent again later on, right? Um, yeah, what, what, what do you think, how do you think the, how do you think the colonial experience kind of affected the modern world? Like what's the, what's the legacy of that colonialism, do you think? Right, so the, the colonizers obtained huge amounts of resources and, and maybe wealth, we could say as well, that they wouldn't have been able to get on their own. Um, what's happened to colonized nations? And I know there's, it depends on which one you're talking about, there's a lot of different histories, but. Right. Yeah, so the, the colonizers kind of came and they, they took resources, they took people, they took human lives, and then they left some things behind, right? Sometimes the language, sometimes a governance structure, um, yeah, other things as well, right? But it's certainly, I think it's certainly fair to say that it's kind of set the stage in terms of global power, right? And most of the nations that are still powerful today are nations that were colonizers or they were colonies, right? And countries that were colonized tend to sometimes still struggle with things, right? They tend to be not very powerful, not very wealthy countries, right? And so, you know, I would say that this colonial process had pretty significant effects in terms of the global balance of power, right? Who has money, who has power, and who does not, right? And there's other factors as well, but that, that colonial period really reformed the globe, right? In terms of, um, yeah, in terms of, in terms of kind of global power. Hi, Ellie. <laughs> so, um, and that's kind of the world that we parachute into in World War I. We parachute into a world that is that's colonial, right? Where Britain and France and Netherlands and Germany, um, they're kind of the big, powerful, wealthy countries. And other countries are um, you know, connected to them, but in a very exploited, unequal relationship. Um, I'm going to back up here a little bit. Whoops, not too far. So this was also a world of industrialism, right? What, 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 is, what, what happened during the Industrial Revolution? Uh, they the 
and the whole process of like the industry like improved very fast. Yeah. So the invention of um, of machines, right, and, and of steam driven machines that increased the production process, right? People were able to manufacture goods far quicker and far more cheaply than they ever had before, right? And so that suddenly fueled this drive for production and that's what fueled colonization, right? As people went out trying to get as many resources as they could, and of course it's much, much more cheap if you just take people's stuff rather than buy it from them. They took it all back to Europe and they manufactured things with it, right? And so these countries industrialized, they built machines, they were hugely productive, they became hugely wealthy and powerful, and again, at the expense of the non-industrialized world. And so this sort of process of industrialization, colonialism, those things are tied together, um, as is capitalism as well. Um, in terms of looking at the beginning of World War I, so that's kind of the world that we that were, were in at the time, um, but it's also a time of nationalistic instability. And so, the, do I have a good map of the Balkans? No, I don't. That's, that's an oversight. So, the Balkans are, bless you, the Balkans are a part of um, sort of southeastern Europe um, where the war will get kicked off. And so um, at the time, what you had was you had a, a part of the world that was under the control of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, a little bit later on, that area would be made into Yugoslavia, if you've ever heard of it. Yugoslavia has broken up, and now we have Serbia and Bosnia-Herzegovina and uh, Albania and places like that. That's where the Balkans are today. And again, at the time, at the time, the Balkans were under the control of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And the reason it was is because there was a very significant trade route moving through there. I'm gonna, actually just going to pull up a map just so we can just so we can talk about it here. As I say, I really should have. There we go. Is that big enough? Right. Perfect. This is actually backpacking the Balkans, so it's not a historical map, but that's okay. Yeah, so you can see, good, you can see there. These are all the countries that kind of exist there. Oh, I can do that, cool. These are the countries that kind of exist in that part of the world today, but at the time, parts of these were under the control of Austro-Hungarian Empire, and um, in the east, they would have been under control of the Ottoman Empire, which precedes Turkey. And so this was an important part of the world because of industrialization and colonialism. So lots of raw materials were being shipped up the Adriatic here and into southern Europe. And so there was lots of um, resources coming in there, lots of money to be made, and the Austro-Hungarians controlled it. But there were lots of different nationalistic groups in that area, right? So there were the Albanians, there were the Serbians, there were the Croatians, and all of them had a very strong feeling of, um, of nationalism, right? They all wanted to, um, they all felt they were a people, right? They had a common language, a common culture, a common history, and they wanted to rule themselves. They didn't want to be ruled by Austria-Hungary, right? And so all of them were pushing for independence, right? To which Austria-Hungary said, no, we're going to remain in control of this part of the world. You nationalists, you just, you just settle down, right? You're not, you're not getting independence. And as a result, there was lots of terrorist activity going on. And so people, the Serbians and the Croatians were bombing, um, you know, setting off bombs in Austro-Hungarian neighborhoods and businesses. They were assassinating people. They were trying to gain independence. Okay, 
So there was lots of conflict in this area, different nationalistic groups fighting against the Austria, Austro-Hungarians, trying to kick them out. But of course, the Austro-Hungarians were powerful militarily, and they could not be so easily removed. More on that later. There was also a lot of militarism going on. And so by militarism, I mean that countries were using their industrial capacity to arm themselves. Okay? So again, you can, you can use your industrial machines to crank out lots of cloth and other sorts of things that you need. But you can also use that technology to build weapons, which they do. Um, as things become increasingly unstable in the Balkans, so again, as things become more and more, um, as there's more and more conflict in this area of the world, European countries start to think that a war is coming. And so they start to build weapons. The problem with that is, is that once once one group starts to do it, everybody starts to do it, right? And so, you know, imagine, you know, you look, you're a country and you look over the fence at the country beside you and you see, oh, they seem to be building a lot of guns and bombs. That's a little scary. I wonder what they're going to do with them. Maybe we should build guns and bombs as well so we can defend themselves or defend ourselves. And so everybody starts doing that. Right? Everybody starts to arm themselves because they start to get worried that something's going to happen, right? And more and more, you know, more and more weapons, um, more and more weapons get built. As time goes on, people start to worry, right? European leaders start to worry. Oh, there might be a war coming. We're we're scared, right? So they start to enter into alliances with each other, and so. The idea here is that, well, you know, if you attack me, you're not just going to attack me. You're going to attack all my friends who, are, who have promised to back me up. And so because I've got so many big, scary friends behind me, you won't, you won't attack me, right? That's the idea anyway. And so European countries start to form alliances with each other, thinking that an attack on one is an attack on all. Therefore, nobody will attack anyone, right? Spoiler alert, it's not going to work, but that's the idea. So kind of what we wind up with is something that looks like something that looks like this. And so we have um, countries like France and Great Britain and Russia um, allied with each other. We have Germany and Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire allied with each other. Everyone thinking that no one would dare attack the other side because there's so many resources behind each side that that should, that should keep the peace, right? Nobody will, nobody will attack because each side is too powerful, right? Now, we'll bring in this idea of nationalism. We talked about it already. And again, it's the idea that a group of people feel like they are part of a, a nation, right? They have a common history, they have a common culture, they have a common language. Um, they, are, they are a people, right? And most of the time, what goes along with nationalism is the idea that nations need to be, they need to have their own state, right? So the French people, should govern themselves in France, right? The German people should govern themselves in Germany, right? And so every kind of national group should have its own country in which to, you know, to, to make its own decisions for itself. And so again, we said that that's, that's kind of the feeling that's happening in the Balkans, is that the Serbians, the Croatians, the Albanians, they feel like they should be in charge of their own destiny. They should get to make their own decisions and be in their own country, right? So there's this idea of nationalism that is fueling these terrorist activities, and it's creating that conflict between Austria-Hungary and some uh, people in the Balkans. So 
sounds like everything is, you know, ready to blow, right? There's lots of weapons being produced. People are ready in alliances. Everyone's a little nervous that fighting might break out somehow. Um, and then we have the spark, right? The catalyst, the thing that sets it all in motion. Um, what do you know about this assassination that happens on June 28th? What do you know about that? Or do you know that? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, right here, right here is the thing that kicks World War I off. Um, let me give you some background. It's kind of an interesting story. So there's a terrorist organization called the Black Hand, which that's a pretty good name, you have to admit, right? If you're gonna yeah, if you're gonna have a terrorist organization, I think that's that sounds pretty pretty badass. But anyway, um, they are, they're Serbians, they're a nationalist group, and so they're fighting to, for independence for Serbia, right? They want the Austro-Hungarians out, they want to create a country called Serbia and rule it for themselves, right? And so the Black Hand has been conducting um, terrorist activities in Serbia, trying to get the Austro-Hungarians out. They've assassinated a few people, and they get word that the Archduke of um, Austria-Hungary, Franz Ferdinand, is coming for an official visit. He's coming to um, he's coming to serve to uh, Sarajevo, I think. So the Black Hand hatches a plan, and the plan is this: so Franz Ferdinand is going to drive down the street, kind of like in a official parade, you know, where there's a parade and the leader waves to the people, you know. And so Franz Ferdinand is going to do this. He's going to drive down the street. And the Black Hand know the parade route. They know the route he's going to take. And so they're there and they're ready. And so they send a few people into the crowd with grenades in their pockets. And so the idea is, is that Franz Ferdinand will drive by in his car pull the pin on the grenade, toss it into the car, and run like hell, right? That's, that's the plan. And they've got a few people in the crowd just in case. So on the day there on June 28th, the car comes driving by, and one member of the Black Hand, he chickens out. Okay, he's like, nope, I'm too scared. I see a policeman over there. Nope, not going to do it. So he doesn't do it car drives by the second guy. The second guy is brave enough, pulls the pin, throws the grenade, but he misses. So the car drives by with Franz Ferdinand, the grenade rolls under another car, blows up, everybody panics, you know, it's, 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 it's total panic, everybody runs away, Franz Ferdinand's car drives off and the, the plan is foiled. Right, see, he got away. Now I'm a little fuzzy on this part of the story, but I think they get lost. And so the driver of the car is supposed to bring them back to the official government building, but he takes a wrong turn somewhere. And so he winds up in, lost in Sarajevo. And so they get to one place in the, the city and it's, it's a dead end. And so the guy has to turn the car around. And so he's turning the car around in this dead end, and out of a cafe, I don't know, with his caramel macchiato or whatever, comes Gavrilo Princep, a member of the Black Hand. And so he walks out and sees, like, there's Franz Ferdinand in the car, you know, as the driver's trying to, like, you know, turn him around in the street. And he walks up and caps Franz Ferdinand and his wife right there in the street. And so it's kind of dumb luck, right? Because the original plan doesn't work at all. And it's just 
happenstance that Gavrilo is in the right place at the right time and he succeeds in assassinating Franz Ferdinand. So here's these two characters here, Franz Ferdinand with his epic mustache and Gavrilo Princep who looks like he was beaten up a little bit by the, by the guards, but um, either way, Ferdinand is dead. Now, this really shouldn't make that much of a difference. It sounds like a big deal, right? Archduke sounds like a big title, does it not? Does that sound like you're an important person? Kind of does. Um, but he's not that big a deal in terms of the Austro-Hungarian royal family. He's not really in line for the throne. Um, he's a member of the royal family, but he's not an important one. He's not the first member of the royal family to be assassinated. Uh, but he's just not that big of a deal, really. Um, but he is dead nonetheless. Um, does anyone know what happens next? No? no? So he is dead, and the Austro-Hungarians demand justice, right? So they say to the Serbian authorities, you know what? This is ridiculous. We are going to do a full investigation. The Serbian authorities say, you know what? No thanks. We, we deny your request. The Austria-Hungarians come back and they say, listen, let us do our investigation and root out these black hand terrorists, or we're going to bring our military in and occupy you. Serbia says, uh, just try it because we're allied with the Russians. So occupy all you want, right? To which the Austro-Hungarians, because they have the backing of Germany, say, okay, we're coming in, right? Um, the other interesting story I heard about this was that the Germans didn't really know what they were getting into. So the Austro-Hungarians and the Germans had made an alliance. Um, the Austro-Hungarians had said, "Hey, look, you know, we're trying to we're, we're trying to get this investigation going on Serbia. Will you back us up?" And I think the Kaiser of Germany said, "Yeah, yeah, no problem. We'll back you up." And then he went on holiday. When he came back from holiday, he found out that the Austro-Hungarians had moved into Serbia and that had brought the Russians into the war and so now Germany had to go in and fight the Russians and so they were kind of like yeah we'll help you with this investigation and the next thing they knew they were in a war with Russia so the whole thing was kind of it's, it's kind of like one kind of ridiculous error after another but what happens is that everybody's alliances get activated Right? And so an attack on Serbia by Austria-Hungary Austria suddenly brings in the Russians. Right, That brings in the Germans. That brings in the French and the British. And suddenly everyone's fighting everyone else within a couple of weeks. Right, And so again, it kind of kicks it off. But do you think anyone cares about Franz Ferdinand? Do you think the British are like, how dare they? How dare they assassinate Franz, whatever his name was? No. Which is kind of the tragic part, right? Is that I don't think anyone cares about Franz Ferdinand except for the Austro-Hungarians. But because everything was so tense before, because everyone was allied, everyone is kind of in before they've really thought it out. And you have a full-scale continental war before anyone's really thought about what what should happen, right? So it's a bit of an accident. And again, you know, this is this is the event that kicks the war off. But strangely, it's not it's not that significant taken on its own, right? It's not the first terrorist thing to happen in the Balkans. It's not the first person to be assassinated. But it just so happens that this is the thing that kicks it all off. It shouldn't, because nobody cares about this guy, but it does. And so 
that's kind of one of the interesting things about history, right? Is that sometimes, you know, you, you have things that are bound to happen, but then sometimes you get just a random funny little coincidence that has a big effect. Right? And so this is one of those things where the effect of this assassination, a full-scale continental war that lasts four years, is not, you know, it is not what you would think would come of this very minor assassination. But that's what happens, right? Okay. Questions, comments, concerns, contradictions, just things you want to say in general. Sophie, what do you want to say? I don't know. What do you think? Knowing what you, I'm not sure your depth of knowledge in World War One, but what do you think? Would it have happened anyway? Huh? Still? Yeah, you, yeah, you have these kind of longer, longer term sort of trends that are happening, right? People arming themselves, people getting worried that a war is coming, people, you know, continually trying to exert control over the Balkans, and the Balkans continuing to resist and push back, and yeah, it's kind of like it's a bubble, right? And the bubble's growing and growing and growing and you know, maybe it doesn't pop this time, but maybe it pops next time, and yeah. It's interesting, right, how you can see these kind of causes, and some are sort of, you know, larger, larger causes that sort of take time to, you know, gather momentum, and, and then there's some things that just happen out of nowhere, right? And this is a perfect example of something that just happens out of nowhere, and it happens to start a war, even though it's, you know, in, in any other, you know, if, if we are in a multiverse, in any other universe, this doesn't, nothing comes of this, right? It's not, it's just not that big a deal. But it's because of what it sets in motion that makes it, makes it a big deal. Do you think there's anything happening in our world today, sorry, I know we're out of time, but and this is a big question. Do you think there's anything happening in our world today that's like this, where, you know, something seems to be, you know, the bubble seems to be growing, and it's kind of like, you know, what will pop it? Is there anything you can think of? The technology of? Um, I, I guess it probably felt that way, right? That um, during the nuclear arms race, people were building huge numbers of nuclear weapons, and it was the question of like, what's, what will set off a nuclear war? And that's maybe still an important question today. Hmm. That is a good one. Anything else come to mind? No? I know, that, that's not a fair question to ask you with 30 seconds left, so. Okay, um, that is all for today, good people. You can pack it up. I will see you tomorrow, and we'll talk just a little bit about what this World War I thing was about, okay? All right, see you, see you online, people.